Hey, you made it. Thanks for being here. So if you're anything like me, then the first thing you thought of after watching Dune in 2021 was how soon can I see the sequel? I mean, it was a masterpiece. The sound design alone had Dune Part 1 reaching the top of my favorite movie theater experiences ever. And isn't that what theaters are for? Experiences? And going into Dune 2, I confidently expected no less from director Denis Vill Villeneuve? I, I apologize. I spent so much tr time trying to research how he says his name, and I'm sure all of you are going to get angry at me. So I'm just going to call him Denis Villeneuve because I'm not sure. I'm so sorry. Well, I was so excited for Dune 2 and what he was going to do with Dune 2 and his team who were so passionately and actively involved in creating a perfect ecosystem that was necessary for successfully completing such a grand and culturally praised story. And it's teams like this comprised of masters in their craft, such as Hans Zimmer and dedicated department leads who are given the freedom to express their creativity, who have a natural on-brand intuition and in knowing exactly what the movie needs. This is what I think we need to see studios prioritizing creating, these expertly recruited villages of master creatives. It's teams like this that remind us of how good cinema can be. But the question is, why don't we see movies like Dune as often or simply any on-screen story, big or small? And I don't just mean large-scale sci-fi, but while we don't see deep and enriched stories coming out of any of our most loved fictional worlds as much. What is it that Dune 2 got right? Anyway, my name's not important, and this is Abominable Culture. Dune 2 was incredible. It's one of those very few movies where the credits roll and you look at your friends, jaws dropped and eyes wide, hoping to be the first person to say how much you loved it. To be the first person to say what you noticed and how callbacks, foreshadows, and easter eggs all connected with each other. And one of the best things they knew how to show in both part 1 and 2 is scale. Dune, without even mentioning the color, the cinematography, or any of the design looks incredible. It's one of the only franchises that I know of right now that knows how to properly show scale. The vast emptiness of each planet and landscape actually complements the isolated characters, structures, or vehicles located anywhere on screen. Seeing such a large spaceship stand solo or amongst others on an otherwise barren setting does wonders for our judgment of scale, and normally a setup like that would hurt our judgment. Seeing a large object surrounded by emptiness would usually harm the communication of scale. But what Dune does is pay very close attention to detail, whether that be with setting, people, or geological formations besides these great crafts and structures to show their true size, or having the audience become acquainted with these machines and buildings up close and then pulling out for us to see the true size and greatness of these structures. Dune also has a great way of exhibiting movement and speed between both small and large pieces, depending not only on size, but the distance our camera's perspective is from them. Them. This attention to detail and this dedication to properly referencing the scaling of Frank Herbert's fictional world is one of the major cornerstones Dune has for being regarded as such a well-made film. And most people don't realize that the scaling is why they may have loved Dune so much. Because it's these very tools within Dune's filmmaking that transports us into these terrifying and beautiful worlds. And furthermore, these heavy machines, visually tactile kingdoms, and impressive explosions give off a brutal and significant presence on screen in each scene. And what I noticed that really landed the immersion for me is the stillness and the fluid motion of all the large ships. Watching something the size of Manhattan itself rest weightlessly in the air as it rains down fire is a small yet important level of world building that increases the immersion of the story. And I say world building because this level of technology and engineering seen in Dune pushes your imagination into wondering what the evolution of this empire and eons old religions have done to accomplish such things. And it's this small and almost insignificant part of the CGI and vision communication that completes the overall story. Something as simple as this scene and moment from the first movie tells me exactly what to expect, and Dune Part 2 did not disappoint. The scaling is why we feel immersed, why we feel like we are living through the rich histories of this galaxy as moments unfold before our eyes, why so many 
are leaving the theater absolutely blown away and hungry for more. And the ironed out architecture and design of each planet and its culturally inspired aesthetic is vastly different between these fictional cultures. And within these cultures, each design choice is complementary to the rest of the pieces presented in their architecture and engineering, showing a consistent tone for each different society. We are engulfed in aesthetic sublimity. And furthermore, what also transports us into these worlds and what most people, myself included, notice first is the sound. I believe it's true that the most important part of a movie is the story because story needs to come first, but without proper sound, it's likely that the story won't be digested well enough for people to have the impression they did after watching Dune 2. To keep it simple, this movie perfected its fictional and real world sound so well that along with the scale, the sound was perfectly crafted in order to elicit an emotional response from the audience. And I can never get enough of the sound design for the voice power used by the Bene Gesserit. The simple yet impactful, imaginated way of showing the audience the power of the voice is guttural. Every time a character uses it, it hits perfectly along with the visuals they include and the performance given by the actors each time. This movie is an ecosystem. Everything is a complement to something else. And I know it's cliche to say, and I know you've practically heard me say it already, but this movie was visually stunning. And I don't just mean the massive settings, landscapes, and structures that I continue to mention, but the makeup, the costumes, the lighting, the way each planet and their culture react to their own natural elements. One of the things that stood out most to my friends and I was just how cool the sun over the planet Gaty Prime caused the planet to only be seen in black and white. This was such a small detail. Was it the incredibly detailed way the Fremen lived with what they had to do with the technology to extract clean water from their dead and how they honored their religion? No. Was it the deep histories mentioned and important to the Bene Gesserit in their millenniums old plan to set the galaxy on their desired course? No. Was it even similar to the references of loyalty in the Atreides house throughout their centuries of rule? No. This detail was small, yet it drove home how focused the storytellers were in creating the story of Dune. All that was said before just now, all the references made about the Fremen, the intergalactic witches, and the stoic men of these great houses, these are all very important details. All of which are mentioned and explored at length within these movies. But then for the storytellers to continue, to add to the way the sun reacts with the skin, clothing, buildings, and even the fireworks within different atmospheres, is a show of incredible dedication to forming a near perfect depiction of a culturally and ecologically rich fictional world. These details, this dedication and focus on the visual storytelling yet again help the audience to be further immersed into the lore of this galaxy. Things are different, people are different, culture in these movies is everywhere and we are introduced to each part of this story and its people thoroughly, whether that be through the visual storytelling, the addicting and dramatic plot or the rich lore and world building, which by the way, is expertly explained to us without us having felt talked down to. This sci-fi epic guides you through all the reasons you became invested into the story the moment the first image fades in, but what it doesn't do is spoon feed you. Look, I can go on and on all day about this movie's beauty, about how intense and exciting the battles were, how real the violence and the stakes of this movie felt all due to the help of the visual perfection and hard work of this amazing team. But what Dune Part 2 and Dune Part 1 has done, which other big franchises and high concept sci-fi continue to fail at, is simply planning. Most movies and franchises, sci-fi or not, are failing at planning. Get your shot glasses ready because I'm about to say something that you probably heard a lot of people say when it comes to movies like this. You ready? I read the book. Yes, yes, it's true. But here's the thing. When I read the book, it was actually really hard to get through. It. Something I think Frank Herbert doesn't do very well is explain setting. So when I read the book, I was very confused. And honestly, I didn't have all that great of a time. But when I watched Dune Part 1, I loved it. I loved it so much that I went back to read the book a second time and I was blown away. The visuals in Dune Part 1 interpreted by the talented creatives involved in the project helped my mind conjure up the world Frank Herbert meant to depict through his words. In Dune Part 2, De Denis, the you know what I'm trying to say? De Denis Veloon, Veloon, what I'm so sorry. He doesn't hold back, and he continued his expertly visioned depiction of Frank Herbert's world in Dune Part 2. Everything about this world feels like it should be there. Nothing's out of place, and the performances 
of the actor drive home the realistic qualities of such an ecologically devastated planet in galactic culture. This story, all of Dune, was told by storytellers both in front and behind the camera who know exactly what they were doing for this story. And I say all of this to explain how what other franchises lack is planning. It's something our supposed to be most anticipated movies don't do today. In fact, many mega budgeted movies these days are in the process of writing the story while they are also in the process of filming it. This isn't good, and these franchises are starting to feel the pains of their mistakes, of not properly acquiring the best minds to tackle these projects while also inserting too many cooks in the kitchen, which is one of the biggest problems I believe modern franchises have. Too many people that are in charge. There are only a handful of movies that have come out within recent years that have made me feel somewhat close to what Dune has made me feel. And of those movies such as Top Gun Maverick, The Batman, The Creator, and a few others, each planned out their scenes perfectly in order for the audience to not say, then what happens next? And rather say, therefore, this is sure to happen next. The difference being a dedication to fluid storytelling causes and effects. This convinces the audience that we are not just watching a story, but we feel as though we are living. The story of Dune Part 2, having not read the book or having not seen or remembered Dune Part 1, may be very confusing due to the rich lore. However, I know plenty of people who loved this movie, regardless of their understanding of the lore, and it's because in all aspects, this movie was as perfect as it could become prior to its deadline release. And it's because of the immense planning that went into it. And within other franchises such as Star Wars, Marvel, DC, and plenty of adapted streaming TV shows, we witness the lack of planning. We witness the lack of vision. And I'm going to say it again, but in a different kind of context. We are missing scale. And I, I, you know, I don't just mean how things look on screen, how large and incredible things look on screen, but I feel like we are missing out on people who are willing to scale their imagination. We can see through these franchises the budget cuts, the laziness, the money grabs. I mean, don't tell me you watched any of the last five Sony Marvel movies and then say that they had a perfect team that was prepared to deliver a decently planned franchise. It just doesn't happen. The world of movie making is changing, but not without growing pains. Things are decaying, yet things are also evolving. I truly believe we, after some time, will be entering a new age of cinema hopefully one that continues to produce well thought out movies like Doom. I'm going to kind of jump off the rails here and mention a video game in order to explain what I mean. Recently a new game called Helldivers 2 came out and it's taken control over the internet. Everyone is obsessed with it and not only is every part of the game something that gamers have been asking for for years, but it's also only $40 whereas most games today can be between $70 in $80. Well, now that this game is doing so well, other companies are looking at it and realizing how much they missed out on and all the things these franchises have been doing wrong. The higher ups in the gaming world are beginning to see that they are losing touch with not just their audience, but with their business platform. And I'd say the same is happening with film. From Disney to HBO, these companies are slowly starting to realize that they can no longer get away with half-baked content. And the success of Dune is pushing this truth even further. Dune is a story of rebellion, of duty, stoicism, fatherhood, motherhood, sacrifice, religion, betrayal, politics. Dune is a beautifully crafted conglomeration of each emotion that so many aspiring franchises lack. Dune makes you Feel something. Dune reminded me of what it was like to watch an epic story as a child and to adopt new values based on the intelligent, stoic, and sacrificial actions of the characters. Of how to treat people, how to treat myself, what to fight for, what to live for, and the type of both good and bad men that exist in this world in the minds of the people who wrote these stories who have in fact experienced such men. The lessons to be learned from these meticulously designed stories influence our psyche. And I guarantee you that somewhere out there, there is a small child feeling about Dune in the exact same way so many of us have felt once before or even currently while watching the most influential stories 
of our child and adulthood. And these children, much like us who experience these spectacular stories, will now aspire to be such a storyteller. These are the stories we should be telling. And although money plays a huge role, you can no longer, or perhaps you never really were able to just throw money at a project in order to make it better. What you need are dedicated teams of hardworking creatives who all have the same goal of creating the most accurate interpretation of source materials combined with the well-labored writings of the storyteller. Dune 2 was incredible, and I still have so much to say about it. I didn't even get a chance to talk about the deep meanings behind the emotions of Paul and his family, or for any of the characters for that matter, and their beliefs on life in this story. I mean, each culture, each people have such richness of them. Like, if you watch just the Gaty Prime scenes there are so few of them but oh my gosh just the things it talks about the things it shows and all the prisoners and their cells and this coliseum and watching death on live television is basically what they're doing for them it's it's such it's such a rich fictional culture and i and I, i'd love to talk about it. i want to talk more about it i want to talk about the spoilers about all the things that happen in this movie is so incredible but that that would be a very large, large video. There's so much to unpack, so much to talk about, and so much to enjoy. Even just the fact that the third movie will be an adaptation of the second book, Dune Messiah, is something to talk about. But maybe that will be for another video. Anyway, please go out and see this movie. Thank you for being here. I'm glad you made it. And I'll see you on the next one. You guys couldn't tell. I am sick. Do you hear how nasally I am? Pretty bad. Very sick right now. I confidently expected no less from director- Oh, I don't know how to say his name. How the fuck do you say his name? I, I don't- I don't know how to say his name. Oh my god. It's- it's not- is it Dennis? Hmm. Vil- Vil- What is this? Maybe if I just look up a, uh, an interview. The interviewer will say- will say his name. Dennis- Vet- Dennis- uh, it's not even- oh my god. Alright, say your name. Some- someone say his name. Bro, I'm so bad. It's so bad, I can't do this. Okay, no this. one's saying his name in this. A conversation with Nolan in Villeneuve. Oh my gosh, what's his name? Oh, you fucking scared the shit out of me, god damn it. Hi, my name is Denis Villeneuve. I'm the- What- did, how did he say that? What did he just say? Hi, my name is Denis Villeneuve. I'm the Danny V. Love? Danny V. Love? Oh no, I- Oh my god, I have no idea how to say his name. Hi, my name is Danny V. Love. Danny V. Love? Danny V. Love. Hi, my name is Danny V. Love. Danny V. Love? Bro, I don't- I'm gonna screw this up. Hi, my name is Danny V. Love. How do you say his name? Alright, I'm gonna- I'm gonna run with it. Oh well. Let's restart. Let's just restart this entire video. I don't- What am I doing?